In the last video we looked at using the chi-squared goodness of fit test with frequency data and in this video I'm going to look at a slightly different application of the chi-squared goodness of fit test and that's where we have something called a Poisson process. So as usual I'll use an example to uh, explain how this uh, um, particular type of analysis works. So we're going to look at uh, data on mass extinctions. So there's uh, a quick look at uh, the details on the data set and um, what this data represents is the, uh, the number of recorded extinctions of marine invertebrate families in 76 blocks of time of similar duration through the fossil record. So to take a look at the data, we have to do a little bit of uh, pre-processing. So I'm going to set up a factor representing the integers going from 0 up to 20. And then I'm going to create a frequency table. So let's take a look at the frequency table and I'll explain what this represents. So uh, we've got 76 blocks of time and there were 13 of those blocks of time where we had one extinction. Uh, 15 of those 76 blocks of time had two extinctions and so on. All the way up to there was one out of the 76 blocks of time that had 20 extinctions. Uh, there, were, there were none that didn't have any ex uh, extinctions. That's what the zero zero is at the beginning there. I'm just going to make sure that I've got a record of the total number of blocks of time and just confirming that it is 76. Okay, so uh, we're doing a chi-squared goodness of fit test here and as usual the first step is to state the null and the alternative hypotheses. So the null hypothesis here is that the number of extinctions per time interval has a Poisson distribution. And the alternative hypothesis is that the number of extinctions per time interval does not have a Poisson distribution. And what that's saying essentially is that uh, if it has a Poisson distribution, then it means that the data represents counts of uh, an extinction uh, in blocks of time where those extinctions occurring are occurring independently of one another with equal probability at every instant in in time. So that's that's kind of the, the technical definition of what it means for something to have a Poisson distribution. So that's what we're looking at here. And we're trying to figure out whether these frequencies here that we're observing, whether they are consistent with a Poisson distribution. Okay, so that's our, our null and our alternative hypotheses. That's step one. Step two is to calculate the test statistic. So to calculate the test statistic, what we need to do is these are the observed frequencies. We need to calculate expected frequencies if the null hypothesis was true. So if we really did have data that uh, is following a, a Poisson distribution. So to do that, we need to go through uh, a few steps. So the first thing we need to do is to figure out what the mean number of extinctions is. Okay, so the way that we do that is to uh, run this piece of code here. And it looks like the mean number of extinctions is 4.21. Okay, so that's our, our mean number of uh, extinctions. And then we can use the formula for uh, calculating probabilities for a Poisson distribution with a particular mean. And that formula is given with this code here. And so that's one way of getting the expected proportions. Yeah, let's round those numbers so that they're a little easier to see. Uh, let's try that again. Oh, goodness. 
I'll get there in a second. Let's round them to four decimal places. Okay, there we go. So there's the uh, expected proportions for each of the 21 categories. And we, we obtained those directly using the formula. Uh, it's actually a bit easy, easier to use the built-in uh, R function, uh, d plus, which uh, uh, essentially implements this formula without us having to remember what that formula is. So this gives us exactly the same uh, numbers that we just got before. Okay, so so it's a little easier, a little bit less typing to, to use the d plus function. And then so we have our expected proportions. So to get our expected frequencies, just multiply those proportions by um, 76. Okay, so here's our expected frequencies. Oh, again, let's uh, round these so that we don't have all that uh, ugly scientific notation. There we go. Okay, so uh, let's, let's have a quick look at the, a histogram for what that looks like. So there's a histogram of our expected frequencies. Um, and then uh, there's just a uh, no, actually, sorry, I, I misspeak. This is a histogram of our data. Okay, so if we remember our data was this table here, 0, 13, 15, 16, and so on. So the bars are the data. This line is the Poisson expected uh, proportions. And so what we're what we're doing here essentially is sorry for all this scrolling I get one to get back to where I was uh, what we're doing with this test is we're essentially saying uh, does it seem plausible that this data that we see in the bars could have come from this Poisson distribution okay and I think just kind of eyeballing it I would probably say no <laughs> Um, those bars don't really match up with the curve very well. There's, there's, they're, they're too high here and then too low here. And, uh, and these, these ones up here, they're kind of almost like outliers. So um, I, I would guess we're going to end up with rejecting the null hypothesis in this case and concluding that this data doesn't really look like it comes from a Poisson distribution. Uh, but we need to do the test formally to actually um, come up with a, an accurate assessment of, of that. Okay, so uh, next step is to look at a table of frequencies. So let's do that. Uh, and again, we've got those, that awkward uh, scientific notation. So let's um, Let's round things. Extinct frequency. Uh, how many decimal places? Let's go for. Uh, what did I do? I must have spelt something wrong. Yes, I did. There we go. Okay, so that's a little easier to see. So this is a table where I've got my observed frequencies for each category in this column, and then I've got my expected frequencies uh, if the null hypothesis is true, if we really are uh, looking at Poisson data here. And uh, I just showed you how those expected frequencies were calculated up here using the, uh, uh, the, the formula for a Poisson distribution and then just multiplying the, the probabilities by or the proportions by the sample size. Okay, so uh, at this point we might go, okay, we're in the same situation as we were in the last video. Let's just use a chi-squared goodness of fit test. Uh, but hang on, we've got assumptions that go along with that test. And uh, the assumptions are that none of the categories should have an expected frequency less than one. Um, uh oh, all of those categories have expected frequencies less than one. So 
right away we know that we are not satisfying the assumptions that would allow us to do a chi-squared goodness of fit test. Uh, the other assumption is that no more than one-fifth of the categories should have expected frequencies less than five. Uh, so we've got a bunch that are less than five. So all of these are less than five, uh, as are these first two. So um, we've, we've got way more than a fifth of the categories having expected frequencies less than five. So we're some way from satisfying the assumptions. So how can we get around that? Well, what if we combined these two categories together? Okay, and had a new category that had a uh, number of extinctions equal to either zero or one. Then the expected frequency for that new category would be the sum of those two numbers, 1.1277 plus 4.7483. So it would be above five. So that, that would be good. And then we could also skip to the end and um, combine some of those categories so that we can satisfy uh, the assumptions as well. So I think if we combined everything from um, 10 and up, I think would do it. So if we combined all of those categories, I think we would end up with uh, something that uh, Actually, no, we, we need to go more than that, don't we? I think we need to go all the way back to here. Yeah, of course we do, because uh, this uh, expected frequency for, for seven extinctions is, is above five, so that's good. So I think we need to combine everything from eight and up. Okay, so let's do that. Um, so to do that, let's go back to where we are. Uh, what was the last thing we did? Uh, we looked at the ex yeah we we did this piece of code didn't we okay so we're at this step now so I'm saying let's create a new variable that groups the extinctions into fewer categories so I've just kind of gone through uh, the idea here so first category is going to be combining the first two either zero extinctions or one extinction and then the last category is going to be eight or more and then everything else is just as it was before Okay, so this piece of code here is going to do exactly what, what I want. Okay, and then um, I need to uh, have a new pair of variables, one with the observed frequencies and one with the expected frequencies. And the way I'm going to get those numbers is I'm going to use this table and add things together. So 0 plus 13 is 13. So that's the observed frequency for the first category. And then 1.1277 plus 4.748368 comes to 5.8760.68. So that's the expected frequency for the first category. Okay, and then all these, all these numbers here are, are already in the table. So 15, 16, 7, 10, 4, 2. And then uh, where's the 9 coming from? The 9's coming from the sum of what I've highlighted in this column. So 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1 <laughs> comes to 9. And then 2.7630 plus 1.2926 plus 0.5443 and so on. Uh, that comes to, where are we here? Uh, 4.914761. Okay, you might go, ah, oh, hang on, that's not five. Uh, but it's okay, because uh, we're allowed from the assumptions to have up to one fifth of the categories having an expected frequency less than five. Okay, as long as we don't have any categories less than one, we're allowed to have up to a fifth of the categories have um, expectant frequencies uh, between um, one and five. Okay, so so uh, this would work. Okay, this grouping. Uh, 
when you're doing this kind of grouping, um, you don't want to be totally arbitrary about things. Uh, you want to have some kind of biological justification for the grouping that you're doing. And so in this context, um, the argument that could be made is that uh, it makes sense to group time periods together uh, where we have either either no extinctions or one extinction uh, from a from a biological perspective that's that's that that makes sense and also uh, we it makes sense to think of a category as being eight or more extinctions in a particular time period um, so so always keep that in mind as well when you're doing this grouping uh, we can actually use a fancy bit of code to do this uh, automatically if we don't trust ourselves to do these hand calculations correctly. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm not going to dwell on that because because this is kind of a pretty uh, complicated function. So I'm not going to worry about that. But uh, if you're interested, if if I did those two calculations, uh, we, we get the same numbers that I just got. OK. Um, OK, uh, one last thing that we need to do is because um, what we've done here is because we've got this eight or more category here, uh, this this uh, expected frequency here isn't actually completely accurate. OK, what we need to do is is instead of this as the expected frequency for the last category is we need to we need to have the sum of the expected frequencies be the same as the sum of the observed frequencies and the sum of the observed frequencies as we mentioned earlier on is 76 so we need these numbers to add up to 76 and right now they don't so to get the correct number for the last category is we need to add up the other numbers and then subtract that from 76. Okay, so that's what this bit of code is doing here. And then now, if I look at uh, the expected numbers, I mean, it was pretty close <laughs> in this case. Uh, it's only off by uh, in, the, in that last decimal place there. Um, but to be accurate, you do need to, to, to do this, this step. Otherwise, you're going to be uh, slightly inaccurate. And you want to be as accurate as you can possibly be whenever you're doing this kind of analysis. OK, uh, so let's um, put these, uh, what we've just done, all together in a single table so that now we can apply the chi-squared goodness of fit test to this table. OK, so now we're back to the situation we were in the last video. We just need to apply uh, the chi-squared goodness of fit test to this table of data. OK, so I'm going to do that and it uh, it's it's telling me uh, it's warning me about something here. Don't worry about this warning. Uh, I think the reason it's coming up is because we did have one category here with an expected frequency less than five. So uh, R has a, a warning message that pops up uh, when that happens. And so uh, uh, we can ignore it because we know we're allowed up to one-fifth of the categories to uh, have an expected frequency uh, less than five. That's okay. Okay, so let's just have a quick look at the observed frequencies. Uh, these, these, this is the data. Uh, here's the expected frequencies again. And then here's the test statistic. So remember the way we get the test statistic is take the difference between the observed and expected, square that difference, divide that squared difference by the expected, do that for every category, and then sum up all those squared uh, scale differences. And we get 23.95. There we go. OK. Um, one final complication. So uh, where are we on our steps? Uh, we've done step one, null and alternative hypothesis. We've done step two, test statistic. Now we're on step three, calculating the p-value. You might go, OK, there's the p-value. Hang on. Um, R doesn't know that when we calculated these expected frequencies, 
we were using a chi-square distribution, sorry, a Poisson distribution, in which we had to estimate the mean. If we go back up here, one of the first things we did was, uh, where is it? We calculated the mean. Okay, because we calculated the mean, then the degrees of freedom for this chi-squared test has to be reduced by one. Okay, so the degrees of freedom is not seven. It's actually seven minus one, it's six. So to calculate the p-value, we have to do an additional calculation. So here's the code that we need to do to get the correct p-value with the correct degrees of freedom. Okay, and it comes to, to this. Okay, so that's step three, the p-value. Step four, make a decision, draw a conclusion. A decision, rule, it's always the same. Reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative if our p-value is smaller than our significance level 0.05. Uh, otherwise, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. In this case, 0.00053349194919 is less than 0 0.05, so we reject the null in favor of the alternative and uh, conclude uh, that um, our data is not consistent with a Poisson distribution. Uh, there's one final um, a conclusion that we can draw uh, for uh, this type of test and if we reject the null hypothesis we're saying that uh, in this case the number of extinctions per time interval does not have a Poisson distribution we can actually look at something called the variance to mean ratio and if that variance to mean ratio is um, greater than one, then we can conclude that the distribution is uh, clumped. Okay, and you can kind of see the clumping in the histogram. Okay, it's there's it, like a clump here. There's another little clump here. There's these outliers up here that are other clumps. So it's not nice and smooth like the Poisson curve it's clumped. Okay, so that's our conclusion here is that the data um, appears to be clumped. Okay, because we've got a variance to mean ratio greater than one. Uh, if that uh, variance to mean ratio was less than one, uh, then we would conclude that the distribution is dispersed. Okay, so those are the two possibilities if we're rejecting the null hypothesis uh, for this type of test. Uh, if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, so if we've got a p-value bigger than 0.05, uh, we wouldn't reject the null hypothesis, and in that case we would conclude that the distribution is compatible with a Poisson distribution. In other words, that uh, the um, extinctions in this case are random in time. Okay, but that's not the conclusion in this case. The conclusion in, in this case is that the extinctions um, are, are clumped. Okay. All right, so uh, that is a, uh, a quick run through of a chi square goodness of fit test for um, events that are random in space or time, uh, and in other words, following a Poisson distribution.